<laughs> we are here. All right, so here we are producing our seventh episode of Easy Refined Dining. In this episode, I'm gonna be showing you how to make kabocha scarpignac, which is a handmade stuffed pasta, one of my absolute favorites. In addition, I'm gonna be crusting some flounder. <laughs> if you got a chance to watch our last video where we reviewed Mr. Takahashi's Yanagiba, then you, then you saw the flounder that we had already processed in preparation for this episode. So if you want to see how to process a, a whole flounder, go back to uh, that video and we'll show you everything uh, that you need to know for that. Otherwise, we're going to show you how to herb crust it, we're going to show you how to make the scarpignac, and then we're going to toast some vegetables. But um, the next thing to do is you know, get started on this pasta because it takes a little bit longer than, than everything else. And then we're going to take that kobocha squash and turn it into a puree. It's going to be absolutely delicious. I'm really excited for this meal because it's one of my favorites. So. Stay tuned. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and share. And um, let's see what kind of beautiful plating we can put together this time around. All right, so as part of our dish that we're doing today, I'm going to be showing you guys how to hand make some pasta. And we're doing two different types of pasta to create one dish. So. Um, here is grano arso. Grano arso is charred flour, so it's going to give us a little bit of the bitterness, some of that nice char to our to our um, our scarpignac. And then the rest is going to be a semolina based flour. So we should have some nice black and yellow on our pasta, like when we actually start to fill and um, form our scarpignac. So it's really pretty simple um, for the semolina based. It's essentially a two to one ratio. So I'm using two cups of uh, semolina flour to one cup of flour and three eggs. So let's just go ahead and knock that out now. This will be generally quick. Just slowly knock in your flour as you go and try to blend it all together. It's going to be a little bit loose, then we're going to kind of bring it all together. It's going to start forming these shreds, at which point we'll mold up. So in this case, it's a little bit drier. So I have my water to add to the mix. Just use it as you need it. You don't no need to measure it. We want the dough to, coat, to come together before we start to knead it. Now for the second part, which is our grano arso. Grano arso again is charred flour. That's how it gets a black coloring. 
chips up. That means you're gonna get a little bit of that burnt char flavor, which we want, but we don't want too much. So with that said, I do an even split. I do 50% grano arso and 50% AP. Two eggs, so one cup to one cup. And for those that don't know where to get grano arso, go to almondgourmet.com and they have it pretty readily available. Next, we're going to prepare the filling for our scarpignac. Now, just so you guys know a little history of scarpignac so you get an idea of where it comes from. Essentially, it's a handmade ravioli style filled pasta that comes from the Lombardy region of Italy. Um, scarpa, which is where the term really got, originates from, means shoe. So essentially, it's a filled pasta that looks like an old shoe. So it's a nice traditional, you know, homemade pasta. So that's what we're gonna teach you guys how to make. And today we're gonna to fill it with kombucha squash, otherwise known as Japanese pumpkin. Now in this case, I like using a heavier blade to cut through this pumpkin because it's a pretty stiff rind. Some squashes are a little bit easier to uh, peel and cut than others. This one is generally tougher. It's a pretty dense, firm meat. So I'm using my cooking guild, Kieran Cleaver. Um, so uh, you guys want one of these, check out my code down below. Um, go to the Cooking Guild website and pick yourself up a cleaver. You'll get it for 20% off. And uh, but let's let's let you guys watch to see how well it cuts right through this hard pumpkin. All right. So you can see how bright that color is. Oh man, that smells amazing. Oh, it's almost got like a musk melon aroma to it. It's completely different than the American pumpkin that we have here in the States. Alright, so just take your spoon and you want to pour out this webbing and these seeds. done it should look just like this simple and clean and then next always bear claw keep your fingers away from the blade we're just gonna peel off that rind all right so chopping these up really simple I want roughly a one by one inch cube they do not have to be perfect cubes because we're going to be boiling them. Again, be mindful of your hand. Go at whatever pace makes you feel comfortable and keeps you safe. All right, so next I'm gonna start preparing what I need for my sauce. Um, so the sauce that I'm making to go with this is gonna be essentially like a garden sauce. So in my garden sauce, I like to use fresh leeks, uh, Roma tomatoes, shallots, fresh sage, and fresh thyme, and then I just season it with salt and pepper. Again, this recipe is generally uh, simple as well. These are all just bright organic flavors um, uh, that are going to do really well. It's going to be, it's going to taste very early summer, you know, late spring. So it's going to taste like the seasons, but overall, it's a super delicious dish. Uh, so I'm going to start with the leeks. Now, there's a trick to, um, you know, processing organic leeks. And whenever you cut into an organic leek, you'll notice they're usually pretty dirty. So, to avoid using dirty leeks, what I do is split it, cut it in about one inch slices, and then place it in water. Now what this does, the leeks stay floating to the top, 
and it gives me an opportunity to clean them. Because although I love an earthy flavor, I'm not really interested in the dirt. So I'm going to go ahead and process the rest of these leeks, and then we're going to do the shallots. And uh, before we get to the tomatoes, we need to peel them. So we're going to use some hot water from our pumpkin that we're cooking to go ahead and break the skin on those aromas so that way we can get those peeled. Again, this is all going to be blended up. So I cut it in nine pieces per half. Just throw them right in there with your leeks. When we cook this sauce, it's not going to be like a traditional uh, tomato-based sauce where we're letting it cook all day in cast iron. In this case, we're going to be cooking it generally quick because we want those bright flavors. Now, one of our next videos is going to be a traditional um, tomato sauce, which we're talking like I cook mine over three days. Do you have to cook it that long? No. But do you want to build character or flavor? Absolutely. So that will be the next video. That's going to be a nice, long, fun, uh, fun video. Um, you know, maybe we'll break that down into two separate. Maybe we'll do a day where we make our own pasta and a day where, you know, we just kind of bake the sauce because even though the cooking portion of it is long and slow, the uh, video itself will probably just be kind of sped up so you get the idea without having to take up too much of your time. Alright, so now you can see we boiled our pumpkin. It gets pretty quick. Um, it gets soft pretty quick. Um, so in this case, you can see it's slightly over, which is exactly where I want it. Now I'm going to add three tablespoons of butter and let that melt in. Now a lot of this is going to break down as I'm mixing my butter in. This is the pot is right off the stove, so everything is still hot enough to melt that butter without me having to recook it. So you can kind of see how it's going there. All right, just a little shake of the peppercorn. I mean, not even half a teaspoon. I would say like a quarter teaspoon. And this is about a quarter teaspoon of salt. You just salt to get the taste. You don't want to go too heavy on it. And that's all the flavoring that we're going to do. You'll see, nice creamy texture. So, next we're going to finish up what we need for the sauce. So, one really large shallot, one bulb of garlic, and then we're going to tie off some sage and fresh thyme. I'm going to try to run away from you apparently. Alright, now a little twine. Take your time and your sage. And just wrap it up tight. Alright, so. That's all. So next, we're going to get to our flour. Now we have our pre-made gold pasta and our pre-made grana arso black pasta. So we're going to separate this to smaller portions to make it easier to have to manage. And also, I don't know how much I'll truly need until I get done using it. So 
Whatever I don't use, I'll store and make pasta another day. I get about three days before I'll end up using it all. Alright, so, general idea when rolling out dough, if you don't use a KitchenAid, which a lot of people do, I like to do everything with my hands. Um, you know, at the restaurant, I'll use my pasta roller to save time, but at home, I like to stick to my hands, I like to feel my dough, it's more intimate. I don't want it to be too thin, I don't want it to be too thick, so the general idea is when it starts to get thin enough to where you can see your fingers through the dough, that's when I know that it's thin enough. So now let's get this rolled out and I'll cut it sliced. Alright, so. I went ahead and I got started without you guys, um, just so I have a couple of these already preset, so that way you know exactly what it is we're looking for. So you know, having the two variations is going to be a flavor variation. Um, the, the textures are going to be pretty, pretty identical. But if you look, this is how each each uh, piece of pasta is going to look. You're going to have grano arso half and then semolina half. Now, there's always one pretty side and one ugly side. So the ugly side, we Lay open, this is where we put the filling, and the idea is to have ravioli have that nice straight line down the middle. Now I'm going to show you guys how I did these. so feel free to take your time just make sure that you're keeping care of your dough not breaking it not folding it over on itself all great fruit requires great handling Now, I want to evenly place my dough with a slight overlap. Let's give it a very light tap. Any excess, let's cut off. Now, give it a light. Do not put too much pressure. This will automatically adhere into one another. There's no need for water. I'm going to 
balance out my dough to make a perfect square. All right, so now I have my 20 uh, dual color pastas. I'm going to uh, get this portion of it cleaned up and then we're gonna stuff each one of these with um, our pumpkin filling. All right, so now we're going to stuff our pasta. So the important thing is you wanna, whatever part is the, is the uneven side, that's the side you wanna put your filling in. I always verify, take a touch of water, and then just run it down my seam. This just make sure that it's properly adhered. Shouldn't have any issues, but this will guarantee it. All right, now, this is where your center is, so this is where we're gonna roll. So you wanna take your filling and fill essentially this space here. Now you're rolling, just like that. So you should come out on the other side, exactly split down the middle, and press. Until it forms a nice little pillow like that, and then pinch. So, you should have these peaks, then clip off my edges for aesthetics. And then take one finger and press it right in the center. And that is a scarfing out. There's your old shoe. Alright, so next, the easiest part of the dinner. We've got some cremini mushrooms. We're essentially going to slice these so that they're even with the cap. And then it's going to go in with some fresh thyme. I'm going to crush and mince up this garlic. And then a little bit of butter. And we're going to saute these brown, these uh, cremini mushrooms. And this is going to be a nice little side that goes along with our meat. Alright, 
So next we need to prepare what we need for the uh, snap pea salad. And we're going to be doing that salad in a half shell. So what that means is we take the snap pea, we're going to pop the shell and keep it intact. Remove the peas, give them a quick blanch, and then between the peas and some Tobago roe and some edible flowers and some and some broccoli greens, we're going to create a little salad and we're going to put it inside, back inside of the shell, and that's how it's going to be uh, presented on the plate. So you'll see that next. All right. So next, really simple. We're going to create the half shells for these peas. So we want the peas and the shell separate. So I clip off each end. Then there's a line that literally shows you exactly where it goes. Slice up through that. And these come right apart. See? So we want to take and separate the pea from the shell. And then we're going to blanch these peas really quick. It doesn't take long. And then we're actually going to cool them because this is going to be a cold element on the plate. Alright, so I'm going to go ahead and do nine more of these and get these pea salads built because they can sit in the refrigerator and they're coming on the plate last. So I'll probably bring them to the room temperature before I, put, before I do the plating. Now we're going to build our salads. So essentially what I want to do for this is, this, uh, these are some broccoli sprouts. I'm going to kind of fill the base with some of the sprouts. And then I'm gonna go get some of the wasabi roe. Always known as tobago. It's flying fish roe with wasabi. Alright. Then, then I'm gonna chew some peas. And some microflowers. Break a couple of these off. I like to mix my color. These, of course, are edible flowers, so don't be afraid of them. They actually add a really nice floral note to your dish. All right. I always go stem piece in first. There we go, just like that. And finish it with just a little bit of lemon oil. Alright. Just like that, we have a beautiful open pea half shell salad. So now I'm going to do this eight more times and then I'm going to go ahead and crush my flounder and get it in the oven. 